Uh, on the 27th of September started the war. Um, what is your answer to the question, who shot first? The answer is Armenia, and we have evidences because the first victims among civilians and military personnel were Azerbaijani. That was the third in a row military provocation against us. The first was in July when they launched an attack on the state border between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and we had casualties among civilians and military personnel. The second uh, attempt was August, when Armenia sent a sabotage group whose leader was detained, and he gave evidence that he was sent in order to attack civilians. And the third time, on the 27th of September, they launched a heavy artillery bombardment on some of the villages and cities situated close to the line of contact. We responded, and so that's how it started. means you will be fighting to the finish. We will fight until the uh, end if Armenia does not make a commitment that they will withdraw from occupied territories. I think Armenia is making a big mistake because if they listen to us uh, from the very beginning, the war would have stopped a uh, long time ago and we would have been already on the negotiation table. But with respect, Mr. President, you're delivering an ultimatum. You are saying that they have to agree to give up all of this territory and then there can be talks. That's, that's a very big precondition for talks. No, not exactly, because what I'm saying is based on the basic principles. And basic principles are very clear with respect to the liberation of the territories surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh. It is very clear message to Armenia, and unfortunately Armenia did not uh, agree to the basic principles which have been elaborated by the Minsk Group co-chairs and the previous Armenian uh, leadership. These basic principles say that the first stage, they have to liberate five occupied territories, at the second stage, two, but already four out of five has already been liberated. Therefore, if they do it, when they will liberate part of Agdam, when they will liberate Kelbejar and Lachin, we will stop. So just to be clear, President, because these locations are not familiar to our international audience, are you saying that if, if the Armenian leadership agrees to vacate the territories outside of Nagorno-Karabakh, you will stop, you will not fight on? Exactly, that's the position which uh, I articulated many times. At the same time, this is not the whole, uh, you know, issues on the negotiation table. Of course, after that, we will uh, work on the return of Azerbaijani uh, refugees to Nagorno-Karabakh. Because before the war of uh, the 90s, there have been 40,000 Azerbaijanis living in Nagorno-Karabakh, and the percentage of Azerbaijani population was 25%. So they expelled them all, and after that, uh, committed the ethnic cleansing and then announced uh, independence. But the fear is that if you take control of Nagorno-Karabakh by force, that you may do exactly the same. There are very strong fears being expressed by Armenia that there will be ethnic cleansing of their people. This is groundless accusations. First, if Armenia really is concerned about that, why they do not agree to the basic principle? Because if basic principles are confirmed and Armenia will make a commitment, which I for many times already uh, I'm demanding from them, then everything will stop. So you are, not, you are not asking them to withdraw from Nagorno-Karabakh, you are asking only for the territories alongside. We demand implementation of uh, UN Security Council resolutions, which were adopted back in 1993, which demanded immediate, uh, complete and unconditional withdrawal of Armenian troops from the occupied territories. With respect to the uh, Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh, they will continue to live there, they are our citizens, and I on many occasions express this position. Well, with respect, President Aliyev, you are saying that the Armenians will consider to live there as your citizens. You have very recently said, and I'm quoting you here, if they do not leave, we will chase them like dogs. Now, that's that hardly the kind of statement that would no, make no, people no. feel safe. Please, be, be accurate with my statements. What I said, I meant uh, the, those who continue to occupy our territories. I meant Armenian military political leadership. I meant so-called authorities of Nagorno-Karabakh, this criminal junta, which already, by the way, ran away. And I got information that the so-called leader of Nagorno-Karabakh is already in Yerevan. So I meant them. I didn't mean Armenian people. 
So and are you saying that you will give an absolute guarantee that there will be no ethnic cleansing of Armenian citizens yes. in Nagorno-Karabakh? Yes, we are not uh, Armenians. They committed ethnic cleansing against us. They expelled all Azerbaijanis from Nagorno-Karabakh and seven surrounding districts. Thus, we have one million uh, refugees as a result of the ethnic cleansing policy of Armenia. But we will not behave in the same way. We will not take revenge. I said many times when even they bombed Ganja, when they bombed Barda, when they bombed other cities and killed 92 people, civilians, I said we will take revenge on the battlefield. Therefore, taking into account this official position and the fact that there are thousands of Armenians who live in Azerbaijan and nobody is <laughs> ethnically cleansing them, why should we do it there? Well, with regard to the Armenians who are living here in Azerbaijan, we have been told that many live in fear, that they change their surnames because they do not want to be identified openly as Armenians. So how can Armenians no. in Nagorno-Karabakh have confidence that they no, will be safe? this is wrong information. There are well, it's coming from people who are here. Well, maybe somebody uh, got married and changed the name. That's uh, usual practice here, but um, no. There are many Armenians who live here and we know that they are Armenian. And by the way, I can tell you, not many people know this. The sister of the former Armenian defense minister, former defense minister Arutunyan, lives in Azerbaijan. You know, if you would like, we can organize a meeting with her. Therefore, this is not actually fear, this is Armenian propaganda. But coming to this subject, I mean, wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be a goal somehow to, to um, take over those seven districts and afterwards to negotiate maybe and to come to an autonomous zone of Bergkarabakh? We suggested that, but Armenians always reject it. Uh, the co-chairs of the Minsk group can uh, prove what I say. We always suggested, we always were committed to the peace plan, so-called uh, basic principles, which uh, provided the liberation of the occupied territories of Azerbaijan in phases. At the first stage, five. At the second stage, two. But now among those five, almost uh, all of them have been already liberated. Therefore, Armenia always was against that. And frankly speaking, what we've seen on the battlefield after we liberated the territories, those, uh, you know, engineering constructions which we built, they invested maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, they show that they were not planning to leave those territories. Because if they planned to leave the territories, they wouldn't have invested so much. There are several lines of defense with the modern equipment, modern weapons, and modern engineering uh, technology. Therefore, all their uh, behavior on negotiation table was an attempt to mislead the uh, mediators and us. They were making the negotiation endless and wanted to win time, what they've managed to do for 27 years. Therefore, we are committed to the basic principles. The seven districts must be returned to us. Never Armenians lived in those districts. Plus, Azerbaijanis who were expelled from Nagorno-Karabakh, and there have been 40,000 people of Azerbaijani origin in Nagorno-Karabakh before war, must return there. And then that's how the plan should be implemented. An autonomous region without any Azerbaijani influence. Uh, that was part of the discussions, but we didn't come to a final agreement about that. But you would agree about that? Well, we need to discuss it now, because now there are new realities on the ground. Always we heard one... Uh, what kind of influence do you want to have there, in an autonomous region? I mean, no. this is contradicting by itself. No, first of all, we did not agree on any autonomous region. This is first. We didn't come to this agreement. When we were suggesting that, Armenians were rejected. They were demanding independence, which we did not agree. Now, the realities on the ground have changed. We heard many times that there are realities, and you have to take them into account. We said, okay, so we change the realities. Now they will have to take it into account. And what we suggested them during these 27 years, maybe not uh, valid any longer. Therefore, we need to have discussions now. And by the way, we are ready to send our foreign minister to Geneva tomorrow to start new round of negotiations, if Armenia is ready, and to discuss the future of Nagorno-Karabakh at the negotiation table. But for that, Armenia should stop. They always wanted, during these months, to regain back the territories which were liberated, and that was the main reason for their defeat.
in this area among us, the question came up, why actually is Bergkarabakh so important for Azerbaijan? I mean, is, is there a kind of resource or is it just symbolic? Elsass and Lataringia, is it important for you? Hmm? Bavaria, is it important for you? Or uh, Rhein Westphalia? It's our land, our territory, internationally recognized. It's not a matter of resources. We have main resources here in Baku. It's a matter of justice, it's a matter of national pride, and it's a matter of international law. International law and uh, the whole international community recognizes Nagorno Karabakh as integral part of Azerbaijan. And we are restoring justice and we are implementing UN Security Council resolutions which were on paper for 27 years. Are you actually recognizing that the majority of the people in this region were Armenians, as most historians say, worldwide? Uh, with respect to history, I can tell you that Armenians were uh, transported or brought to this region after the peace agreement between uh, Karabakh Khanate and Ibrahim Khalil Khan signed it, and Russian Empire. And the agreement was signed by Russian General Sisyanov in the beginning of 19th century. Aren't they living there since centuries? No, no, no. They started to be uh, transported to Nagorno-Karabakh after Kurekche peace agreement, and then Gulistan peace agreement, Turkmenche peace agreement, uh, 1805, 1813, 1828. You can see in internet, there is no mentioning of Armenians in this agreement. Armenians then were brought by Tsarist Russia from Eastern Anatolia and from Persia in order to change the ethnic and religious composition of the region. So most of the uh, historians, experts on the Caucasus uh, region are wrong? Yes, of course, because look at the documents. Historians, which historians? There are different historians, and history sometimes is motivated by political preferences. But look at those documents there in internet, and you can see, if you find any mentioning of Armenian population, uh, you will say that I'm wrong. So that's how it was. But the other thing is, yes, they live there for 200 years, and the word Karabakh is Azerbaijani word, it's not Armenian word. Do you know how they call so-called capital of Nagorno-Karabakh? Stepanakir. You know in whose uh, honor it is called? Stepan Shaumian. Stepan Shaumian was an Armenian Russian Bolshevik, head of the criminal gang here, which committed a genocide against Azerbaijanis in 1918. So, if it was an ancient Armenian territory, why it is named Karabakh? And why the capital city is named Stepanakert and not some ancient name? Because they lived there for 200 years. In 1978, Armenians who lived there raised a monument, 150 years of their arrival to Nagorno-Karabakh. This is history. But again, they lived for 200 years, and we want them to live. And I said many times, we want Azerbaijanis to go back, and Armenians live there where they lived historically for 200 years, no matter. Nevertheless, these people experience your uh, military action as, how they say, uh, ethnical cleansing. No, no, not at all. We've been the subject of ethnic cleansing. When they occupied Nagorno-Karabakh and seven districts surrounding it, we had 750,000 Azerbaijanis ethnically cleansed from seven districts plus from Shusha, which was part of Nagorno-Karabakh. We've been subject of ethnic cleansing. We didn't do any ethnic cleansing against Armenians, and we're not planning to do it now, because I said that we have to live together. It will not be easy, but we'll have to learn. But civilians were killed there right now, in the last couple of weeks. Civilians were killed in Azerbaijan also. 69... There as well. Yes, because it's a war. But 69 civilians killed in the territories which are far away from uh, the conflict zone, in Ganja, more than 300 civilians uh, have been wounded by Armenians. It's a war. It happens, unfortunately. Institutionalized messaging against the Armenians, which takes place here, it's part of the state dialogue. People have been primed to have hatred for the other side. Are you actually expecting them to be able to coexist? why they can coexist in other parts of the world. 
Do you know that there are villages in the neighboring Georgia where Armenians and Azerbaijanis live together in the same village? They live together in Russia, they live together in Ukraine, they live together in Azerbaijan, in many other parts of the world. And if you uh, observe the situation in the world now, uh, apart from some uh, pro-Armenian rallies in the West, the situation between Armenians and Azerbaijanis is very calm and quiet. Why they can live there and cannot live here? Do you honestly expect a single Armenian to stay and remain in Nagorno-Karabakh if you take control and live under the rule of Azerbaijan? I, I think it is possible because I, as a president, say today and said many times that we want to live side by side. And if we didn't want to live side by side, why should I say that? Today, as you know, Azerbaijani army is uh, winning the battle. Today, we liberate one city after another, one village after another. And uh, in principle, anyone in Azerbaijan can say, look, they committed genocide in Khojali. They expelled Azerbaijanis from their native land. They destroyed all our cities and Armenians, uh, of course, also claimed that they were expelled and they were the victims of, of massacres from over the years. From where they've been expelled? From where? They have not been expelled. We did not commit ethnic cleansing against Armenians. No, Armenians live in Azerbaijan. They expelled us not only from Nagorno-Karabakh, but from seven districts uh, on the administrative border of Nagorno-Karabakh where Armenian population never lived. Two days ago, I heard you in the radio asking the question, where has Armenia the money from to, to do this war? Yeah. What is the, the answer? No answer. I'm asking this question for one month. We uh, made a preliminary calculation. I guess somebody who's asking this question continuously somehow has an answer on mind. Well, if I had an answer, I wouldn't have asked. If I'm still asking, it means that I didn't get an answer. We made a preliminary calculation about the minimum. And by the way, I did not disclose all what we have destroyed. That will come. $2.7 billion cost of the ammunition, which we destroyed and which we took as a trophy. Where the money comes from? Armenia is a poor country. Its budget is less than $2 billion. Its foreign debt is $8 billion. They are supported by Russia. That's, that was, that's your opinion, yeah? You well, say? This is official. This is no um, secret. Yeah. Somebody else? Maybe. I don't know. So I'm asking, but nobody is responding. So I will continue to ask. Um, why like this this time? Is it the predominance of the Azerbaijan military because of the drones from Israel and Turkey? We had these drones from Israel already for many years. And by the way, some of them were used uh, in 2016 during the, again, uh, Armenian provocation, which launched in the liberation of the part of the occupied territories. But that clash lasted for several days because Armenia stopped. And if they stopped this time, we would have stopped also, but they didn't. They wanted to uh, make a big damage. They started to shell cities which situate far beyond the line of contact. And we had many uh, victims among civilians, so far 69. So we had to defend ourselves, defend our people, and to respond. So our response was harsh, but they deserve it. As far as I understand, you gained some ground in the south especially, but as well, I mean, uh, next to Bergkarabakh, uh, further in the north. And how long will this war continue? It depends on Armenia. I said many times, uh, we are ready to stop today. And by the way, uh, the fact that three times we agreed for ceasefire demonstrates our will to stop military confrontation and to resolve this issue uh, on the negotiation table. Uh, by political, you know, uh, purposes, political means. But three times Armenia brutally violated the ceasefire. But they claim the same. But look, yes, yeah, definitely they do. But look at what happened. Uh, on the 10th of October, the humanitarian ceasefire was announced. The next day, they launched a ballistic missile attack on Ganja from the territory of Armenia. And probably you've seen the devastation which is caused, and 10 people were killed civilians. They say it's not them, but it is clear because the launch of ballistic missiles is observed by the satellite. So three countries, the coaches of MIS group, definitely they know who did it. The second time they did the same, they violated ceasefire two minutes after it was announced. And the third time, 
uh, yesterday when they launched their uh, cluster bomb on the city of Terter. Four people were killed, uh, among them one seven-year-old girl. So it was them. There's no evidence that we did it. What we do is opposite. I said that we will not respond to them the same way. We will respond to them on the battlefield. We do not attack cities. We do not attack civilians. Only on the battlefield, but we have to defend ourselves. If they attack you, if they want to regain the positions which they lost, we cannot just uh, stay calm. We need to defend. And the more that we defend, the more territories we liberate. But if they recognize uh, the independence of nagorno karabakh what would your reaction be? You know, if they wanted to recognize, they would have recognized a long time ago. Why they did not recognize it before? Because they clearly understand that by this uh, very irrational step, negotiations will stop. Absolutely. So if they do it, there'll be nothing to talk about. And then no peaceful initiative, no basic principles, no future, uh, you know, settlement, nothing will be on the table. So I, I think that they understand it. They always wanted to use it as a kind of a instrument in order to frighten us, saying that if Azerbaijan does that, we will recognize. I tell them many times during these uh, days of war, and I tell now, Armenian Prime Minister, recognize Nagorno-Karabakh today. Do it. Show your courage. Show that your words mean something. Recognize Nagorno-Karabakh today. Again. And you will see that they will not do it. Because they are cowards. They can fight only against peaceful civilians. And when they see this, they run away. Big process now. Um Mediation has been ongoing with the OSCE Minsk Group, the co-chairs at the moment, France, US and Russia. Do you think that structure should remain, that France should remain a co-chair in those negotiations? We, uh, you know, re we're receiving the contradictory, some uh, statements and some messages from the very beginning of the outbreak. But I think due to our uh, mutual diplomatic efforts, we managed to uh, keep situation under control. Uh, as you know, I received uh, several phone calls from uh, President Macron and our last conversation was very positive. Uh, we committed to uh, you know, our efforts to find a political solution to the conflict. I was informed that France will, as a co-chair, will uh, remain neutral because that's the mandate for co-chair. This morning I was informed that the French Foreign Minister issued a statement that uh, due to the fact that France is a co-chair of the Minsk Group, France must be neutral. We fully support this position and our position always was that all the co-chairs must uh, be neutral. They should not take sides because it's uh, contradicting their mandate. In a national capacity, every country has allies, friends, uh, with some countries more active relations, with some countries less active. This is normal and no one is objecting to that. But if some countries have a mandate to be a mediator, of course, both sides, I'm sure, Armenia and Azerbaijan, expects neutrality. And we see this neutrality now. Therefore, I think the issue which you are referring to now is uh, over. And so we close that page. In previous interviews, you've called for an apology from Emmanuel Macron after his rep remarks saying that 300 fighters from Syria had been brought to fight for your side. When you last spoke to him, did you speak about this, is this issue, him accusing uh, yes, uh, mercenaries yes. of fighting for your yes, side? Yes, of course. Yes, we spoke about that and I was still waiting for evidence. No evidence was presented to me. Uh, no evidence was presented to our other officials. Uh, I asked the French president to give evidence and uh, uh, to organize contacts between the heads of corresponding uh, state units in order to talk, in order to exchange this information. And this contact happened. And I can tell you that no evidence was presented to us. Therefore, if there is no evidence, I think these uh, rumors should also uh, be left back in the history. We don't have mercenaries. This is our official uh, statement. And since the outbreak, already more than two weeks passed, not a single country presented us a single evidence of that. And, and moreover, we don't need that. We have an army of more than one 
100,000 fighters. And what we are doing now on the ground demonstrates that our army is capable to liberate its land itself. You have said that you would like to see Armenia withdraw its troops, but you have also said that you're not prepared to accept peacekeepers there. How else can you reassure your counterparts, the Armenians, that you would not then retake the whole land? Uh, if you can tell me when I said that I don't want to see peacekeepers, I will answer you, but I never said that. That's wrong information, I'm sorry. I you never said... You to accept peacekeepers on that territory. Uh, peacekeepers is one of the elements which is provided in the basic principles for the settlement, which was elaborated by the OEC means group. And there is an item about peacekeepers. But we did not come to this item to discuss it properly because it's premature. Because first, we need to resolve the core issue, the occupation, liberation of territories. And then, when Azerbaijanis will return, then, of course, peacekeepers should come. It is in the framework of agreement, if it is signed by both sides. Then both sides will select who these peacekeepers will be. So we are not against it, but we actually were not in active phase of negotiations on this item. It doesn't sound though as though your terms of negotiations have changed since before this latest uh, vast outbreak of hostilities. So I'm just wondering why weapons should be placed down now if, if negotiations have never succeeded before. You know, negotiations are taking place since 1992. Since that time, there have been zero progress on the ground, zero progress. And Armenia always was using some, you know, manipulation tools in order to disrupt negotiations. This year, starting from July, they launched three times a military attack on us. On July, they attacked our civilians and our military positions on the border between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan, far away from uh, Karabakh region. That lasted for four days. We pushed back. They could not uh, occupy territories, and we stopped because we don't have any military purpose on the Armenian side. On August 23rd, they sent a sabotage group to commit a terror act, which was detained, and the head of the group gives evidence. On end of September, they launched the artillery bombardment of our cities and killed immediately innocent people. We had to respond. We had to uh, push back. That's what we did. Therefore, we are in favor of negotiation. I can give you two examples. Armenian Prime Minister last year announces that Karabakh is Armenia. What does it mean? It means the end I of... Asked him, I asked him what he meant. Yeah, what he and meant. He said, that it meant he, he said that it meant that ever since the fourth century, there have been Armenian <laughs> churches, there has <laughs> been an Armenian population. And there has, ever since the beginning of the Soviet Union, been a much larger Armenian population, ethnic Armenian population in Nagorno-Karabakh than Azerbaijani. You know, he is telling, mildly speaking, not truth. The Armenians' uh, settlement in that area started after uh, 18, beginning of 19th century Treaty of Kurekchai which was signed by Ibrahim Khan, Azerbaijani, and Russian general. As a result of that treaty, Karabakh Khanat became part of Russia. And Russia started... That, that's, to, uh, that's how it was. That's how Armenians came to Nagorno-Karabakh. It's only two centuries less. He's telling about you fourth century... You have been in power since the beginning of this century, and yet there has been no progress made on this issue. It is all very well to blame the Armenians, but do you take some personal responsibility for the fact that your soldiers are now dying on the front line because you politically have not been able to resolve this? Our soldiers are dying for our land. Our soldiers are dying on Azerbaijani soil, historical and international recognized. On which soil now Armenian soldiers are dying? They are dying now in Fizuli, they are dying in Jabrail, they are dying in other Azerbaijani territories. What they are doing there? You, you should ask Pashinyan what his soldier is doing there. Ninety percent of so-called army of Nagorno-Karabakh consists of Armenian citizens. They are on our land. It's just enough to look at the map. For us, it's a patriotic war. We are defending ourselves. We want to restore our 
territorial integrity to allow one million refugees to go back. That's what we are doing. And for 28 years, we were patient to believe that negotiations will lead to progress. As a result, we got what we've got now. When we push back and punish the aggressor, you know, we are attacked politically. I accepted the basic principles, Pashinyan rejected. I accept the format of negotiations, which is between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Pashinyan says, no, Azerbaijan should negotiate with Nagorno-Karabakh. This is not acceptable, not only by me, this is not acceptable by Min's group. So he is to blame for what happened now. Here. Is diplomacy still an option? Will you sit down and have talks with the Prime Minister of Armenia to find a different way out of this conflict? I can tell you that during my uh, term as a president, I had maybe tens of talks with two former Armenian presidents and the current Prime Minister. And during those previous uh, debates, we made a substantial progress on negotiation table. We elaborated the principles which today are the basis for settlement of the conflict. And we were constructive. Negotiations are taking place since 1992. Can you imagine? For over 30 years. And we were living with hopes. Mediators were telling us that you should wait a little bit. There will be more constructive approach from Armenian side. But when this Prime Minister came to power as a result of the coup d'etat two years ago, he destroyed completely the negotiation process. And I had meetings with him many times. And, but these meetings were absolutely senseless. And he told me that they are not going to give territories back. They told me, uh, me that Nagorno-Karabakh must be, uh, how to say, uh, adjusted to Armenia. So this absolute unacceptable demands to me and also unacceptable for mediators. Armenian government should change their position, should refrain from maximalistic position, should stop telling that Karabakh is Armenia because this is not true and this is uh, destroying the negotiation process. And of course, we are going back. By the way, tomorrow, our foreign minister will be in Geneva meeting with ambassadors of the Minsk group. And as far as I know, Armenian foreign minister was supposed to go there in the beginning of the month, but he ignored that. He is not there. Our foreign minister is there. It shows who wants negotiations and who was just accusations against Azerbaijan. Gesture of goodwill, could you put on the table to try and restart negotiations at this stage? We already did that. Uh, by the way, I can tell you one more thing about who is uh, against negotiations. Our foreign minister of Azerbaijan and Armenia were invited even before this outbreak to Geneva to meet uh, Minsk Group co-chairs. Armenian foreign minister was supposed to go in the beginning of October. Our foreign minister was supposed to go uh, on the 8th of October. So Armenian foreign minister ignored that. He didn't go. Our foreign minister yesterday was in Geneva meeting with the co-chairs. And when we received a proposal from Russia to organize a meeting between foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan in Russia, we agreed. So our foreign minister just uh, an hour ago landed in Moscow and he will be meeting with his Russian counterpart. And I don't know what will be the program. Will he meet Armenian minister or not? But he's there. We want peaceful settlement, but settlement. We want solution, not imitation, not another 30 years of blah, blah, blah. Practical steps, timetable, when our people are going back home, what will be the security guarantees for them, and how we will reconcile. Two nations, they must reconcile. We are neighbors. We cannot live in hostility forever. This must be stopped, but stopped on the basis of historical truth and international law. And a question about journalists operating in Nagorno-Karabakh. Your uh, presidential spokesman has said that because they are there illegally on what you consider to be Azerbaijani territory, they are effectively fair game. Is that something that you believe also? Our position is very fair and clear. Nagorno-Karabakh is an integral part of Azerbaijan. And our position is that if any foreign uh, citizen, any, not only journalist, if he wants or she wants to visit Nagorno-Karabakh, please let us know. We do not uh, expect some kind of, you know, special, you know, attitude. Just inform us that such and such person wants to visit. And when we have this information, when we have this sign of respect 
to our territorial integrity, we never object. So those who go there without this, uh, how to say, procedure, they are being put in the blacklist of our foreign ministry, and the entrance for them to Azerbaijan is forbidden. But if, if those people write a letter to our foreign minister that we made a mistake, or next time we will inform you, we remove them from the blacklist. This is fair. That's the only thing we, we need is just respect. Therefore, for those journalists who want to go there and to cover events, please, I'd like to use this opportunity to deliver a message to them. Please inform our foreign ministry by email and, and go there. No problem. And you will not target them? No, we never do it. We never do it. Why should we? We are interested that journalists are coming. I'm every day on TV. Every day I'm giving interviews because we want to deliver our point. We want to deliver our case. We are not aggressors. We are victims. It's Armenia who is aggressor. We want the territories back. That's all. President what can you say about the, the, the jihadist presence uh, that uh, President Macron and uh, Russian foreign minister denounced that they are fighting uh, against, uh, um, against Armenia uh, at with your army? Is it On many so occasions, I've already during this time, more than one month, uh, referred to this issue and said that this is not true, this is not uh, correct information. I don't know why this information uh, was circulating and still is circulating. First, we haven't been provided with any evidence, any proof about that. All were words, and those words were uh, articulated in the early days of the conflict and you referred to President Macron's uh, statement about that, that was only in the first days of the conflict. Since that time, we didn't hear these kind of statements. So this is first, no proofs, no evidence. Second, no need. Many times I said, we have an army of 100,000 uh, fighters, regular army. We can mobilize several times more if we uh, you know, announce a total mobilization. We have modern weapons. We have sophisticated uh, technology and we have a very high moral spirit. Uh, therefore, there is no need for that. But unfortunately, what happens on the other side is being ignored. Uh, we already have enough evidences uh, about uh, foreigners fighting on Armenian side. They say they're native Armenians, but first, it doesn't make any difference because if foreign citizen is fighting against one country against another, it's a mercenary. And then we do not have 100% uh, evidence that all of them are Armenians. We know that there are others. We know that PKK is there. We know that some uh, terrorists from the Middle East joined uh, so-called uh, army of Nagorno-Karabakh. Therefore, unfortunately, this issue is absolutely out of picture. So it creates an impression of a deliberate uh, attack, uh, political attack on Azerbaijan. And plus, why Armenians are also exploiting this false statement? Because for them, probably, it is very painful to admit that we beat them on the battlefield. For 30 years, they've been pretending that they have an unbeatable army. For 30 years, they were telling that they, on their own, occupied our territories, though we know that it was wrong. So we proved them who is who. We proved that their so-called unbeatable army is a legend, is a mythology. And for them to admit it is very painful. But they already admitted their defeat. Uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan sent a letter to President Putin asking for military help. This is a admitting of their military defeat and our victory. Um, what will be... Do you, uh, Mr. President, um, you said you have, uh, you have very modern equipment, it is true. You have uh, all kinds of drones, some coming from, from um, uh, Turkey, but also uh, efficient kamikaze drones coming from Israel, Arab. So, so is, the, is the help of uh, Israeli military equipment very important for you? and allow you to make the military breakthrough? We buy military equipment from many countries 
And uh, our biggest uh, supplier of military equipment is not Turkey and uh, Israel, is Russia. But unlike Armenia, from Russia we buy weapons, we pay them. Armenia gets weapons from Russia free of charge. We also buy weapons from Iran, from Ukraine, from Belarus, and of course we can afford to buy modern weapons which uh, today uh, help our army to restore our territorial integrity. And our territorial integrity uh, is being restored by us, but any country in our region is buying weapons. Uh, not uh, many countries in the world can supply themselves 100% with military equipment. So it's nothing uh, strange about that. And of course, uh, we pay for the weapons, we buy good ones, and of course they help us on the ground. But liberation of territories is not by drones. Liberation of territories is by soldiers, by people who there on the ground are doing their job. Uh, Iran has complained that um, uh, fighting during your military operation too close of the border. Did you, did you settle this dispute with Iran? Did you talk to the Iranian leaders? Yes, uh, we did. And as far as I know, Iranian leaders also talked to uh, Armenian side because uh, the clashes were taking place just by the river Aras close to the border with Iran and by accident some of the weapons crossed the border. But today uh, we announced that we cleaned uh, completely Azerbaijani-Iranian border from Armenian occupants. Uh, therefore, no more clashes take place there and there'll be no more inconvenience for our brothers across the river uh, of Aras in Iran. Would you answer to uh, Premier Pashinyan uh, that I met uh, three weeks ago and he said that um, he feared for a new genocide in Nagorno-Karabakh? Absolutely false. All the history is false. Um, there's no signs of that. You know, as I said, there are thousands of Armenians living in Azerbaijan. There is no Azerbaijanis living in uh, Armenia or in Nagorno-Karabakh. 99% of Armenian population are ethnic Armenians. Can you find any other country in our region uh, where such a uh, full domination of one nationality? It's mono-republic. Why? Because either they expel everybody or other nationalities cannot live there. Azerbaijan is a multi-ethnic, multi-confessional country. Therefore, talking about so-called genocide is absolutely unacceptable and this is another fake which they want to uh, present as they always do they always want to present them as the people who are always suffering always crying always needs help and today look he calls president putin five times a day he calls president macron maybe uh, <laughs> less but still he calls everyone he calls european leaders he asks for recognition of nagorno karabakh not understanding that there is a unified position of European Union on territory the integrity of Azerbaijan. Therefore, he tries to use every, you know, uh, fake, uh, how to say, method in order to uh, get some support. Therefore, it's absolutely wrong. And uh, as I said, and I am responsible for what I'm saying, those Armenians who live in Nagorno-Karabakh can be sure that their security will be provided. Uh, they bombed the Ganja because there were some, uh, a, a couple of uh, Turkish F-16 uh, fighters and one of these uh, Turkish F-16 fighters uh, shot down um, Armenian planes. So That's why they said they, uh, they bombed Ganja. This is fake news. I think that everybody now understands that that was a fake news by Armenia. Turkish F-16, uh, they are here because they were participating as a joint military training just before the uh, clashes started, and they are on the ground, they are not in the air. Armenian Su-25 hit the mountain, and uh, they tried to pretend as if uh, it was hit by the Turkish F-16. But that was in the first days of the conflict, it was in September. 
but they launched an attack on Ganjia with ballistic missile on the 10th of October. Uh, first, second, uh, ballistic missiles launch was made from the territory of Armenia. And, uh, you know, big countries can monitor it clearly. They know from where it is launched. And what is the task for the missile? The task was to hit uh, civilians. They hit the area of Ganja where people live. So that was an act of international terror. That was uh, uh, another reflection of the uh, war crime policy of Armenia. These attacks on Ganja cannot be uh, justified and they will be responsible for that. After that, in the beginning of the 90s, there was an anti-Armenian pogrom in Baku. It, uh, it, it's why Armenians do not trust, say they can't leave. They are afraid for their life to live in the Azerbaijan territory. Conflict started uh, after uh, separatists in Nagorno-Karabakh sponsored by nationalists in Armenia, uh, launched a secession plan to secede from uh, Azerbaijan. And they could not do it from legal point of view at the time of the Soviet Union. So they started pogroms in the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh and in the territory of Armenia. The first victims of uh, the war and clashes were Azerbaijanis from Nagorno-Karabakh. There have been uh, 40,000 Azerbaijanis who lived in Nagorno-Karabakh, primarily in Shusha and also in the capital, Hankandi, who were ethnically cleansed completely. Then, 250,000 Azerbaijanis who lived in Armenia. Many of them were killed and all of them were ethnically cleansed, expelled. Those clashes were taking place everywhere, in Yerevan, in uh, other Armenian cities, in Nagorno-Karabakh, Therefore, uh, this should not be a kind of a reason why people cannot uh, reconcile. In Europe, how many times uh, France and Germany had wars? How many times, uh, you know, other uh, countries had wars? We had Second World War, which costed lives of uh, 30 or 40 million people. But after 20 years, after uh, Western Germany and Soviet Union became on good terms, and now nobody remembers that. This is how it should happen in the civilized world. The problem is that in Armenia, they cultivate hatred. They cultivate historical hatred against Turkey, against Azerbaijan. And the former president of Armenia, Kacharyan, publicly said that Azerbaijanis and Armenians cannot live together. But look how they live together, for instance, in Georgia. In some Georgian uh, villages, Azerbaijanis and Armenians live side by side. In Russia, it is the same. In Azerbaijan, we have thousands of uh, Armenians who live in our country. Why it's not possible in Nagorno-Karabakh? I think that the wounds of the war must be healed by political wisdom, by political will. And after this active uh, hot phase of the conflict stops, both sides need to invest largely in order to do everything to heal these wounds. Uh, aren't you afraid, Mr. Pre this is my last question, afraid, Mr. President, that after a while, uh, President Erdogan of Turkey will stop uh, his support uh, uh, and his policy in uh, Caucasus to uh, focus on northern uh, Cyprus? Turkey and Azerbaijan are brotherly countries, and uh, our brotherhood has been tested in many uh, circumstances. And in this particular case, Turkish president uh, expressed publicly a strong support to Azerbaijan. He said that Azerbaijan is not alone, Turkey is side by side. So this is a very strong uh, political support, and we are very grateful for that. This is first thing. Second, what I want to say is that what we are doing on the battlefield, we do ourselves. Yes, with modern weapons, with modern equipment, but it is Azerbaijani soldiers and officers who liberate our motherland. Our relations with Turkey have great uh, history, but even brighter future. And uh, Turkey as a country, which is the only country in the world 
which has a border with all the three republics or countries of Southern Caucasus, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Armenia, has, I think, a legitimate right to be involved in this process. Because as a neighbor, as a country which uh, can provide and provide stability, predictability uh, for the region, and as a country which agenda is very clear, they defend international law. International law says that our territories are under occupation. So what wrong do they do? They just demand international law to be implied. Armenia doesn't want to do it. They want to keep our lands for more than 30 years under occupation by illegal settlement of Armenians from Lebanon, by uh, military operations against Azerbaijanis, by destroying our historical and religious heritage. Turkish role is very positive. And after uh, the war with Armenia stops and political settlement is enforced, I'm sure the role of Turkey will be very important and very positive. So you don't think that Turkey has got a plan to erase Armenia in order to have a direct connection with the Turkish people of Central Asia? No, this is again Armenian phobias, you know, and Armenian uh, provocations. Uh, in the peaceful plan which we, I was discussing with uh, leaders of Armenia before Pashinyan came to power, there was a clear reference to communications. After the peace agreement is signed, all communications are opening, including communication between Nakhchivan, Autonomous Republic of Azerbaijan, and the mainland of Azerbaijan. And thus, Turkey and Azerbaijan and Central Asia will have, you know, land connection. Today we don't have it, but Turkey still has connections through Azerbaijan. We built a couple of years ago, Bakut Bilisi Cars Railroad. So Turkish goods through Georgia, Azerbaijan, Caspian, go to Central Asia and backwards. So the road from Turkey, Nakhchivan, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan is shorter. So it's not the fact that Turkey doesn't have this connection. And as you say, uh, somebody thinks that they want to erase Armenia to have it. They have it. We have it. We will have another one. But... Uh, it is again part of the peace plan. All communications will be opened. And I think that Armenian government should not uh, try to frighten its population with Turkey and should stop this hatred towards Turkish and Azerbaijani people. How is your relationship currently? Relationship with Georgia, who is another Christian nation in the Caucasus uh, region? Yeah, with Georgia, our relations are excellent. We call each other strategic partners. Azerbaijan is the uh, first or second largest investor in Georgia and first or second uh, largest taxpayer. Uh, I'm saying first and second because one year it's Turkey, another year it's Azerbaijan. And we have a trilateral format of cooperation between Turkey, Georgia and Azerbaijan. We had presidential summits, ministerial meetings, including defense ministers, foreign ministers, economic ministers. We have all our major transportation and energy communication going through Georgia. We have a big Azerbaijani community in Georgia, uh, close to 300,000 people. Therefore, relations are excellent, and I think could be a good example, uh, like our relations with Turkey, our relations with Georgia. They are good examples of uh, good neighborhood. And by the way, the fact that Georgia is Christian, Azerbaijan is Muslim, doesn't make any difference. We don't look at this region from this point of view. You don't take uh, religion into account when you do politics? No, religion is separated from the state according to our constitution. Azerbaijan is a secular country. We respect our religion, we respect religions of all other nationalities who live in Azerbaijan. And I think the best indicator of uh, religious harmony in Azerbaijan could be the words of His Holiness, uh, head of uh, Roman Catholic Church, Pope Francis. When he was in Baku several years ago, he made a public statement highly praising Azerbaijan's role in intercultural, interreligious dialogue. And um, 
all the uh, representatives of uh, different religions in Azerbaijan live in peace and harmony, including Armenians. And in the center of Baku, there is an Armenian church which has been restored by us and protected by our government. But our mosques on the occupied territories have been destroyed. And Armenian, they keep pigs in our mosques. Just recent videos was uh, in internet in Zangilan region after liberation of one village. Uh, it was uh, uh, on internet how pigs, you know, walk in our mosque. So Azerbaijan is a tolerant and uh, secular country and will continue to be like that in the future. I spoke to the president of Armenia and he told me that this conflict is dramatically different from the previous clashes because of the open support that Turkey is providing Azerbaijan. Specifically, he told me this, Turkey for its military officers, generals, mercenaries, terroristic jihadis brought in in the thousands to Azerbaijan to fight Nagorno-Karabakh, Turkey with its military might pretending that they are there in order to protect some international logistic structures. Are there any Turkish forces or Turkish equipment in Azerbaijan right now, sir? Turkish equipment, yes. Turkish forces, no. And frankly speaking, I regret that Armenian president is uh, using this uh, opportunity to address the world through CNN to spread uh, rumors. I cannot call it otherwise because what, what he said, as you presented to me, I, I didn't see his um, presentation, but uh, what I heard from you is absolutely wrong. It is false information. And uh, Turkey uh, is supporting us, but this is a political support. This is a diplomatic support. And if not for this support, if not for very open position of the Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, saying that Azerbaijan is not alone, Turkey is with Azerbaijan, probably today uh, Armenia would have achieved their goal, uh, which is actually to spread the geography of this conflict and right. to involve and as many countries as possible in order so these countries uh, help them on the battlefield. And I would also like to uh, remind the Armenian president who was behind Armenia when Armenia in the beginning of the 90s was occupying our territories. We have enough evidences who was helping them to occupy our territories. Therefore, from Armenian side to say that somebody is helping Azerbaijan is absolutely wrong. It's false information and we reject it. You have said that there is Turkish equipment in Azerbaijan. What Turkish equipment, sir? Weapons, Turkish weapons, uh, not only Turkish weapons, uh, Russian weapons, Israeli weapons, Belarusian weapons, Ukrainian weapons, uh, you name it. Because today the geography of our purchases of military equipment is getting broader and broader, and we pay for that. Uh, uh, if you look how Armenia gets their weapons and from where, you will see that those weapons which they have, they could not afford to pay for it because that's billions of dollars. For a poor country, it's not impossible. They get weapons free of charge from uh, their ally. We get weapons paying for them. What does that mean if these weapons can be so imprecise and mistakes can be made so easily? that you shouldn't be using them in civilian areas? We are not using in civilian areas. We are using them in order to destroy military infrastructure. The city of Han Kendi was full of military objects. The city of Shusha full of military objects. We do not attack civilians unlike them. They attack Genja with ballistic missiles, deliberately destroying the civilian compound. Well, let me tell you, Mr. President Aliyev, what our own BBC colleagues have seen. Now, this is not hearsay. This is what was filmed, this was what was experienced by BBC colleagues. They were in Stepanakert in Nagorno-Karabakh on the 1st, 2nd and 3rd of October. They witnessed random shelling of the town, including at an emergency services centre, an apartment block destroyed. As people tried to flee, there was a drone overhead. Shortly afterwards, more shelling nearby. They characterised it as indiscriminate shelling of a town without clear military targets. Now, this is not hearsay. This was witnessed and filmed by the BBC. I doubt this uh, witness 
witnessing. I doubt it. Because it is well, they not... Well, they were there, President Aliyev. So what, they were there? It doesn't mean anything. That can be fake news. We had military... And, and why, w why would that be fake news? Why would any journalist going there decide to broadcast fake news? Because of the biased uh, approach to the conflict, because of this black propaganda against Azerbaijan in international media. So you cannot be guilty of any wrong? Everything, no, is, everything is false news? Absolutely. It is false news and we uh, closely watch the Western media. And during these uh, 40 days, I had maybe almost 30 interviews and all of them were very aggressive and as if it was not an interview as if it was a kind of accusation nothing is happening on armenian side nobody is asking pashinyan why he hits with ballistic missile ganja why he killed 92 people why the attack funeral in Tepter? why they use smirch with cluster bombs to attack uh, barda killing 21 persons and injuring 70. no one asks him no one asks him where does he get weapons. Only attack on us, only demonizing Azerbaijan from international media. So that's why what BBC, your colleagues, so-called witnessed in there, I, I do not believe them. Well, in fact, they filmed it, President Aliyev. But of course, it's important to say that there has been killing of civilians on both sides. There has been indiscriminate shelling on both sides. We have witnessed here ourselves the aftermath of the attack in Ganja in which a ballistic missile was used. So there is no doubt that there have been casualties Thank you on this that. side as well, of course. But equally, when you mention cluster munitions, there is evidence that you have used cluster munitions in civilian areas in the streets of Stepanakert, documented extensively by Human Rights Watch, uh, photographs, videos, testimony from witnesses and they actually had the opportunity to go to the scene. Now, why are you using cluster munitions, which can be so imprecise, in a civilian area? We are not using them. This is another fake news. It is Armenia who uses the cluster bombs. So everything is fake news? Of course. <laughs> why not? We are facing this fake news for decades. But you, you know how many fake news were published in the British press about Azerbaijan? But you admit, thousands, President, you admit President Aliyev, you are fighting a war, you are making advances, but then you're telling us, on the other hand, you're not using these weapons. No, we are not, because we are fighting on the battlefield. We are fighting against Armenian army. We are not fighting against civilians. So, no sense in that, because our task is to liberate the territories, and we liberate one village, one city after another, and we do not use cluster bombs. We don't need it. We have enough other So the evidence tools. uncovered by Human Rights Watch is fake also? Of course, because Human Rights Watch, due to a uh, uh, very biased approach to Azerbaijan, due to the fact that they did not uh, notice any wrongdoing in Armenia, even when journalists are dying in prison, even when main opposition leader is in prison, they don't report on that. Only against us, therefore, we stopped cooperation with Human Rights Watch some five, six years ago. And only now, when this war started, we invited them to come and to see, because we wanted them to testify, because there was no way for them to say no. That's why we invited them. So this organization uh, is not credible in Azerbaijan. May I ask President Aliyev, how many civilians have been killed on this side now? What is the death toll? 92 civilians killed, 405 wounded, uh, almost 3,000 houses either demolished or seriously damaged by Pashinyan regime. So this is a, a fact and you can verify it when you go there and see. We would like to be able to see the front line for ourselves and during our last trip here we were prevented from traveling independently. Can you give us an assurance that we will be able to go there this time? Yeah, I think it is possible uh, but uh, the security measures uh, must be taken in order you know, to protect you. But I think it is possible. It is regulated by the uh, general situation, by the martial law in Azerbaijan. Therefore, it must be in line with this temporary regulation. So we can't have free movement at the front line? Uh, what do you mean the front line? Going where the battle is? Yeah. There have been journalists there. There have been. Uh, but not moving independently. What do you mean independently? Moving independently without minders from the government, moving at their own discretion, which is what we do in other conflicts. 
we decide where we wish to go, we make our own choices, we go there, we film. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I think that must be checked with uh, our authorities uh, whether there's possibility or not. Uh, any company which foreign journalists have only have one uh, purpose, is to protect them and to advise them where they can go and where they cannot go. But there's nothing to hide. You can see you know, our destroyed villages. You've been to Ganja, probably you could have go to Barda also. Therefore, uh, we have nothing to hide. We are fighting on our own land. Armenian army is on our land. They are aggressors and we've been the victims of aggression, but today we pay back. Today we show them their place and we will uh, move them until the end, as I said, if they do not liberate voluntarily the remaining part of the territory. That sounds like a very chilling message to Armenian civilians. No, why? We already talked about Armenian civilians. We have uh, nothing uh, wrong uh, you know, in communications with them. And I said many times, and I think what I say, I keep the word, that after we liberate the territory from these criminal gangs which occupied our territory, Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh will live much better. They will have more salaries because the salary in Azerbaijan is higher, more pensions because pension in Azerbaijan is three times higher in Armenia. They will have all the social protection. We will invest in those areas largely but they will will President Aliyev, could I ask you, going back to the conflict, as you say, 40 days and counting, how long do you expect this to continue? Is this going to be a battle through the winter? Nobody knows. Again, coming back to the beginning of our conversation, if Pashinyan tells today that, yes, I accept basic principles and I will liberate part of Agdam, Kalbajar and Lachim in one week or in two weeks, we will stop. Immediately. But he doesn't need to give you a guarantee for liberating the rest of Nagorno-Karabakh. You are speaking about the territories on the outside. I just want to be very clear yes. to understand your position. That's the basic principles. On the basic principles, we have a very clear picture. Liberation of seven districts, then return of Azerbaijani IDPs, then return of Azerbaijani people, refugees, uh, to Nagorno-Karabakh. So he has to give you Nagorno-Karabakh also? He has to allow Azerbaijanis to go back there, to go back. So you Shushan. don't need to be in control of Nagorno-Karabakh? Well, uh, what do you mean, the control? Do you need to take physical control of Nagorno-Karabakh and remove the Nagorno-Karabakh Defense Forces, remove any Armenian official presence, or are you saying that you would be satisfied if your civilians are allowed to return? Uh, in the basic principles, which Armenia did not accept, and they actually, they are not valid because Armenia did not accept them. Uh, in the basic principles, there is a provision that Azerbaijanis will return there and they will be living there in peace, in security, with security guarantees. We did not go too far in negotiation uh, process in order to specify what kind of governance will be there. Our position is there must be a certain level of self-governance like a municipalian governance or uh, cultural autonomy for Armenians, but we didn't go too far. And if Pashinyan did what I asked from the very beginning, when we liberated Fizuli, then, you know, the war would have stopped and we would have talked now about how to move on the negotiation table. But he doesn't make this commitment. Therefore, if it continues like that, we will continue. There is no other way. We will go until the end before we uh, restore territorial integrity of the country, which is recognized by the whole world. You've made significant advances already and taken territory alongside Nagorno-Karabakh. How soon do you plan to start sending your civilians back? First, we will need to evaluate the damage caused by Armenian state against uh, Azerbaijan and against the property of our citizens. Because uh, in the liberated territories, almost everything is destroyed. I said many times that in the big city of Fizuli, when 10,000 of people live, we could not find any uh, building in order to put a flag on. So we raised it on a the derrick. Therefore, first we will evaluate the damage. We will invite international experts in order to evaluate the damage which was caused to our ecology, to our infrastructure, to our civilians who lost their houses, and to our state to our uh, historical heritage because all the mosques destroyed, all the museums destroyed. This is first. 
And after that, of course, there will be lawsuits. Lawsuits against Armenian state, and we are already preparing for that. Second, we will need to create at least initial conditions for people to live there. Uh, we need to provide, uh, you know, construction materials. We need to invest in infrastructure. So do you think it's a matter of years, realistically? You know, we've already resettled 300,000 uh, refugees and IDPs during all these times of occupation. And the last years were most, you know, impressive because only this year we are resettling 7,000 families of refugees. So we can, I think, uh, manage to resettle from seven to 10,000 families a year. But of course, for that, we need to have infrastructure. We do it in Baku where everything is ready. But in those areas where everything is destroyed, we need power stations, we need roads, we need uh, water supply. So all that will take time. I don't know how long it will take, but we will try to do everything to do it in the maximum. One or two final period. quick questions, President Aliyev, if I may. You have had huge support from Turkey, which is a very strong ally of Azerbaijan. How, how often do you speak to President Erdogan? Very often, especially now, uh, several times a week. And daily? Uh, not daily, but if necessary, maybe several times a day. We are brothers, we are friends. I know you say huge support, you're right, but I want to specify this is a political support and moral support, nothing more than that. Are there Turkish pilots here piloting the drones that are being used? No, no. So they're being used by your forces? Yes, everything is used by our forces, not only Turkish drones, but Israeli drones, and uh, Russian military equipment, and uh, military equipment from other countries which we purchase and which we pay for, unlike Armenia, which gets it free of charge. Everything is done by us. Do you foresee a day when you might want Turkish direct military involvement. We have seen that Armenia has already gone to Russia and said, what are you prepared to do? Yeah. Do you see a day when you would be asking Turkey to become more involved? I don't want to look too far ahead because it will depend on the situation on the battlefield. It will depend on uh, Armenia's behavior and on other countries' behavior because on many occasions I said that we're against internationalization of the conflict. We asked all the countries, neighboring countries and not neighboring countries, to stay away from this conflict. We are fighting on our land internationally, recognized. So this is our position. And I think that uh, what is happening now will continue. So there will be no need for uh, any kind of military involvement uh, of Turkey. But with Turkey, many years ago, we signed a document which provides also military support in case of aggression. So we have more or less the same format, a legal basis like Armenia and Russia have uh, with Turkey. So if Azerbaijan will face an aggression and if Azerbaijan will see that the Turkish military support is needed, then we will consider this option. I'm going to beg your assistance just for two more questions, President yes, sure. Aliyev, if I may. What would you say to, to those who argue, and I'm sure you've heard this argument being made, that one of the reasons why the conflict has reignited now and why you are pursuing such a strong advance is because of this very strong backing from Turkey, that this really has been the clincher for you? No, not at all. And by the way, where is this Turkish uh, military involvement? Who can verify that? Who have seen any Turkish no, not, not involvement on the ground, but the strong political support, the constant statements, the yeah. very strong backing from a very strong regional power. Yes. Has this, that not been a factor in this? This is a factor, but this factor uh, became very important after the conflict started. Because if you follow the chronology of the conflict, so this statement started hours after Armenia attacked us and we pushed back. But Turkish political support to Azerbaijan has always been here. It's not just like it happened all of a sudden. It has always been like that. The th why the conflict started? I can tell you because Armenia wanted to disrupt uh, negotiations. They uh, launched an attack on us on 12 July on the state border and they entered our territory. We had to push back and that clash lasted four days and we stopped after we pushed them back from Azerbaijan and we did not cross the uh, uh, state border. Then uh, in the middle of August, they sent a sabotage group which crossed the line of contact and the head of that group was 
detained and he confessed that they were planning terror acts against civilians. And then they started to shell our cities on the 27th of September and we had the first victims in the early hours, maybe early minutes among civilians and among our military servicemen. They shelled us with uh, heavy artillery. So that's how it started. Why it started? Because President, forgive me, because I, I, I know you wish to tell us the history, but I've one or two uh, more things to cover with you. Okay. You mentioned that the loss of military servicemen. Why is it that you are not releasing the figures for your military losses? Are you concerned that support might wane if people knew how many young men are being killed no, in this war? No, not at all. First, we don't have many. If you uh, look at the scale of the war and the fact that we had to break those engineering constructions and all those, you know, positions which Armenian built for 30 years, our losses are minimum losses. Of course, we cannot talk like that because every life of the human being is uh, priceless. But we have much less losses than Armenians because our uh, military capability is much better and we have uh, modern weapons which allow us, you know, to have minimum losses particularly those drones, because without those drones, all those tanks and guns would have killed so many people. So it is not a reason because we think we will not have public support. On the contrary, those people who live their uh, close relatives, their sons, their brothers, they ask us not to stop. Can you imagine? I receive thousands of letters every day, thousands of letters. And in no one of those letters I saw that stop, no. They say, I lost my son, I lost my brother, I lost my husband. Please go until the end. Please go until the end. Because our people lived in this situation for almost 30 years. But that, that almost sounds, President Aliyev, like you have no way out of this war. Like you must fight to recover every last inch. Yes, that's what I'm saying. But at the same time, I said from the very beginning that if Pashinyan, him personally, not his foreign minister, him personally says, Armenia, withdraws the troops from Agdam, from Kalbejar, from Lachin, the three remaining regions which they have to liberate, and give us a timetable. We will stop immediately. We don't want to continue this war. We don't want. We want to stop. And what I'm saying now, I was saying from the very beginning, and people who know me, they know that I am a person of my word. What I say, I do. If Pashinyan tells it today, I promise you that we will stop immediately. But he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it. He wants to regain back. He wants to uh, use uh, these ceasefire opportunities to regroup this, his forces, to mobilize more people. He is now, as you said, sent a letter to President Putin for military assistance, thus admitting his defeat. And if he admits his defeat, why he cannot say that he will liberate the territories? These territories do not belong to Armenia. These are our lands. They have to give them back to us. If they don't do it, uh, as I said, we will go until the end. No way to stop. Do you know how many civilians have been killed inside Nagorno-Karabakh by the activities of your forces? No, we don't know. We heard the uh, official information from Armenian Defense Ministry. Uh, we do not believe this official information. They say 45 civilians. Yes, I know. 45 or 47. We don't know. Uh, I cannot say something which I don't know. But I think that it is much exaggerated because we did not attack their villages, we did not attack their cities, we only attacked... With respect, President Aliyev, there is documentary evidence yeah, yeah, of look, attacks on their villages yet. and we, on their cities. We attacked Hankandi because Hankandi was full of military uh, installations, civilian so we had to houses, destroy them. Civilian houses have been destroyed. Well, it happens sometimes during the war, it happens. We are, we are not so accurate, you know, if, if the artillery is just next to the house. It is not like Ganja when they hit deliberately by ballistic missiles the civilian compound with no, in the radius of maybe 20, 30 kilometers, no military object. But are you troubled by reports of civilian loss of life? Are yes, of course. I regret. I regret that it happened and uh, I express condolences to all those uh, who lost their, uh, you know, relatives, I mean civilians in Nagorno-Karabakh. But uh, again, taking into account the scope of conflict, uh, again, saying that every life of the person is priceless, still the losses are very low. And this shows 
that we are not fighting against civilians. There you know how many civilians they killed during the war of the 90s? Thousands. Thousands. There are concerns. Or genocide. They killed 613 innocent people, among them 63 children and 106 women, only because they were Azerbaijanis. Hojali genocide is a well-known documented fact. I can tell you, I, can, I want to tell you about one Armenian fake. In the first days of the clashes, they said that uh, Turkish F-16 shut down Armenian Su-25. This is fake. And those who are accusing us of this now should apologize, because everybody knows that this is a fake. F-16s are here, but they're on the ground, as you correctly mentioned. USC's Mintz Group which has sought a solution to this long-standing dispute since the 1990s, is co-chaired by France, by the US, and by Russia. The French foreign minister has specifically warned that Turkey's backing of Azerbaijan risks fueling the internationalization of this conflict. You say you are supported by Turkey, but what do you say to the French when they say this support risks this conflict getting worse. I do not agree with that. As I said, Turkey plays a stabilizing role in the region, and in particular in uh, the situation with respect to Armenia, Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, every country can afford to have a partner and an ally. And Azerbaijan and Azerbaijani people are happy to have such a partner, such an ally, and such a brother like Turkey. We do not object when Armenia uh, considers France their ally. And uh, France is a country which at this moment supports most of all Armenia. At the same time, we see that it's up to countries themselves to choose allies. For instance, uh, French foreign minister is not concerned about Russia supporting Armenia with weapons free of charge. And he does not think that it is internationalization of the conflict. But when Turkey expresses legitimate political support, it becomes a concern. And I, frankly speaking, cannot understand that how one NATO country can act in such a way against another NATO country. NATO members are supposed to be allies, but we don't see it. Have you been in touch with Washington on this? I mean, what, what is the Trump administration telling you? The U.S., of course, one of the co-chairs of the Minsk group. We have very uh, diverse relations with the United States. Relations are developing very successfully in many areas. As far as Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenian Azerbaijani conflict is concerned, three countries of the Minsk Group uh, chairmanship, co-chairs, they have the same uh, right and the same responsibility to mediate. And when representatives from uh, these countries come, they come uh, all together, representatives of free countries. Therefore, there is no distinction uh, in their performance, but of course we understand that some countries uh, are more pro-Armenian, some countries are even more pro-Armenian. So can I just ask you, who are you speaking to in Washington? Is, is it state or is it the Trump administration? I mean, the Armenian president uh, certainly told us that they have spoken to uh, Robert O'Brien, for example. Well, Armenian uh, Prime Minister, I, I think uh, the only person whom he did not speak during these days is the head of a tribe in some faraway, uh, you know, remote island. He called everyone. He called President Putin five times. He called President Macron, I don't know, four times. He called Chancellor Merkel. He called, the only left is a tribe, boss tribe. I, I advise him to call him and to complain on Azerbaijan and to send some people from his tribe to help poor, poor Armenia, whom Azerbaijan is destroying. So that wasn't the question. The question was, who are you speaking to in Washington? Is it state <laughs> or is it the Trump administration? Uh, we speak with administration. We speak to State Department. Actually, they contacted us. I uh, gave instructions to our uh, foreign ministry, to my administration, to be in touch with all those who call us, who want to express their position and express their view on how to move forward. 
But it actually doesn't make any difference whether it's State Department or White House, because for us, it's U.S. administration anyway. Support. But what's the position, as you understand it, in Washington? Uh, the position in Washington is not different from the position of other co-chairs. They are uh, supporting the um, principles uh, based on which the solution must be found. It's Armenia who is against those principles. Those principles, they say that territories surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh should be returned to Azerbaijan in time. And when you were referring, referring to my statement timetable, that's exactly what is in the documents. It's not me who invented them. It's Armenia who is against. Let's have a look at Russia's position then, um, because it's, it's not clear um, to me what Washington's position is from what we've just discussed. But let's have a look at, at Russia's position. Let me play out some sound from the Kremlin spokesman, Dmitry Peskov. He said, we re remain deeply concerned by the situation in the region, and we believe that the sides must stop the fire and come to the negotiating table. They are really? asking yeah. that you get to the negotiating table. The Russian president has described the fighting as a tragedy. You personally spoke to Vladimir Putin, as I understand it, on Wednesday. What did he tell you? What, what are Russia's red lines here? I called uh, President Putin in order to congratulate him on the occasion of his birthday on the 7th of October. I do it every year, and so does he. So every year we congratulate each other with our birthdays. And that was a coincidence that his birthday is, uh, you know, coincided with the events. Therefore, of course, we discussed this issue. And uh, our press service have issued a press release about that. I think it will not be right for me to say something more than it was released in the press. I, I, I wish you would. I mean, are you prepared to defy Moscow's appeal for peace talks? We are for peace talks. If you allow me, I will just give you two examples. Azerbaijan is a constructive partner to negotiation table. We think that the principles which have been elaborated by United States, Russia and France should be basis for settlement. Armenian president rejects them. Uh, I'm sorry, Armenian prime minister rejects them uh, because the person who is in charge in Armenia is not a president, is prime minister and with whom I had negotiations. So he said that Karabakh is Armenia. That makes negotiations senseless because how you can say that Karabakh is Armenia and negotiate to return the territories back? He said Azerbaijan should negotiate not with Armenia but with Nagorno-Karabakh, which is a change of format. So we are ready for negotiations if Armenian prime minister returns back from the skies with his flying back to honors. That is not the position as I understand it, from the Russians who say both sides must stop the fire and come to the negotiating table. Those who started fire should stop first and we uh, will do the same. But to go back to negotiation table, Pashinyan regime did everything to destroy negotiations. They made this statement. They attacked us in July. They attacked us in August. They attacked us in September. They do everything in order to disrupt negotiations. We are ready, but they are not. If you, if you won't stop and they won't stop, what happens next? Where does this leave the conflict, which so many people are now concerned could escalate into a much wider regional war? It should not escalate wider. Uh, I uh, call all the countries to stay away from this situation. It's uh, our bilateral issue with Armenia. Mediators they have, they have their mandate. Their mandate is not to interfere on the ground. Their mandate is to facilitate to find the solution. So they will continue, I'm sure, within the framework of their mandate. Armenia's attempt to make this conflict international is a very counterproductive, destructive, and dangerous for many countries. So Armenia should understand that occupation cannot last forever status quo must be changed. And by the way, presidents, former presidents of France, former presidents of uh, United States and president of Russia made a statement when they, all of them were in, in, in charge. 
status quo is unacceptable and must be changed, and I support it, but Armenia is against it. Do you accept that there is a danger now of a humanitarian catastrophe this winter in Nagorno-Karabakh? You are closing in. You could be in a position soon to besiege the area. What is going to be the fate of the civilians inside? That's the question not to me, to Pashinyan, to stop. And I say how to stop. But you could cut them off. If they're cut off by your forces, how can they survive? We will take care of them. We will take care of them, absolutely. No doubt about that. We will provide them with everything, with food, with water, with everything. No doubt about that. And all our, all our military commanders got a direct instruction from me in the first hours of the conflict that civilians must be taken care of. Do you know the story about two elderly persons whom uh, we found in Gadrut? Just their relatives and the military, they just left them and went, <laughs> run away. So one lady and one gentleman, uh, almost 90 years old. And we brought them here to Baku. We put them to the hospital and we surrendered them to <laughs> Armenia. But you know what happened? When that uh, old gentleman was already on the border uh, in Kazakh, far away from here, Armenians refused to accept him. They said he is ill and he will die soon. We don't want him, you know? That's what they've done. And this person, under the care of uh, Red Cross, was put to the hospital and the lady was surrendered to them. And the man, unfortunately, died. That's how we treat civilians. Therefore, those who live in Nagorno-Karabakh now, they can be absolutely sure that we will take care of them and they will live under Azerbaijani, uh, you know, umbrella much better. But 90,000 of them approximately have already fled. They don't seem to be comforted by these assurances. According to our information, the real population of uh, those who live in Nagorno-Karabakh was from 60 to 70,000 people. All those figures are highly exaggerated. Therefore, <laughs> I doubt that 90,000 could flee because the maximum, maximum 70. May I ask you a long-term question, President Aliyev? How, how do you see the future of the South Caucasus? How do you see peace coming here? I mean, do you ever see a day when there will be peace between Azerbaijan and Armenia? Yes, if you ask my position, I think it is possible, but it not only depends on me, it depends only on Armenian side. And during these 40 days of war, on several occasions, I said that I wish to see the day when three uh, Southern Caucasian uh, countries would uh, be, you know, working together. As, for instance, we do with Georgia, our close strategic partner and uh, friend. Look how many projects we implemented with them, how close our relations are. They're based on historical, uh, you know, legacy and they're based on pragmatism, on uh, balance of our interests. So why Armenia became isolated? Because of occupation. And if you look at the map of, for instance, our energy and transportation projects, you will see that they bypass Armenia. The shortest way for us to deliver our resources to the international market was through Armenia, and we offered them that in the 90s. We said, look, liberate the territories. Let's build the pipeline uh, through Armenian territory, and then entering Nakhchivan, and then Turkey. We will then combine the interests of all countries. We'll make all countries of the region in a certain way, interdependent, and that will be a guarantee for peace. They said no. I offer many times, uh, through Ms. Group co chairs they can prove it, uh, financial assistance, social programs in Nagorno-Karabakh, and financing from our budget, if they liberate territory, they said no. I offer autonomy, the highest possible autonomy in the world I offer to Nagorno-Karabakh. Armenians said no. They said no to everything. So what happens now is their fault. And by the way, the first president who was overthrown by Karabakhi clan published an article saying that what Azerbaijanis are offering now to us, they will not offer. That was in the middle of 90s. And you would accept an autonomous status now for Nagorno-Karabakh? Mm, now, I prefer not to talk about that because now situation on the ground has changed. But I offered this many times, and Armenians rejected it. So now what do you want for Nagorno-Karabakh? Nagorno-Karabakh is part of Azerbaijan. 
it will be part of Azerbaijan as any other region of Azerbaijan. It will depend, again, on what will be Armenian government behavior. It is still not too late for them to be reasonable. It is still not too late for them to get more on the negotiation table. Because after we take control of other you know, cities and villages, there will be nothing to talk about. So they're losing time. And if uh, they behave reasonably, we can uh, work on some forms of self-governance. We are not against it. But they should not violate territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. They should be based on the best practice which European countries like Italy, like Sweden and Finland have between themselves. Why this should be something different? And uh, then, of course, uh, the peace will come to the region. And I think that, but frankly speaking, with this Prime Minister of Armenia, I don't think that there is any possibility for peace. There must be a change of government in Armenia. Reasonable people must come. Those people which are not affiliated with bloodshed and the military crimes. And then I think by joint actions we can create a new format of cooperation in the Southern Caucasus among Azerbaijan, Georgia and Armenia, which used to be in Soviet times. We had friendly relations, we lived together. Is there any compromise that you can offer for the sake of peace? Is there anything that you can say now you are prepared to give? You know, I cannot offer compromise when other sides just uh, is not willing to compromise. You know, uh, during these times, Armenian Prime Minister also on several occasions was, you know, interviewed by foreign journalists. And he was asked, there was one program on Russian TV, they were asking the same questions to me and to him. And when I was asked about compromise, I said what I'm saying to you. When he was asked about compromise three times, he said, self-determination for Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. But this is not compromise. What compromise they are ready to do? And by the way, today the opportunities to compromise is shrinking because we are getting those territories back by force. Our compromise is still on the table, but uh, it is not 100% sure that it will be on the table if we take all these territories back. Then what we will talk about? So for Armenian Prime Minister, for him, for his own sake, it is the best thing is now to listen to me and to say publicly, we liberate Agdam, Kalbajar, and uh, Lachin. And we stop, and there'll be a ceasefire, and uh, if they don't violate it again, and we will come back to those issues which you uh, refer to, status, autonomy, cultural autonomy, uh, community, etc. But we can be fair, and I am always fair with our people. Today, situation changed. Therefore, what I offered to them a year ago, two years ago, maybe is not valid. But it is premature to talk about this. Your um, response to a new report from Amnesty International claiming that they have, quote, identified Israeli-made MO95 DPICM cluster munitions that appear to have been fired by Azerbaijani forces. Now, CNN cannot independently verify those claims, nor the apparent video of the explosions. But, sir, how do you respond to Amnesty's claims? Uh, I would say that uh, the organization which you named, we don't have any contact with them because of their pro-Armenian and anti-Azerbaijani position. First, it's wrong, it's false. And second, I would recommend them to see how cluster bombs are being used against our civilians, how they use Smerch, how they use Elbrus, Tochka U, ballistic missiles on our cities, Ganja, Geramboy, Naftalan, uh, Yevlak, and other cities are under Armenian bombardment. Why Amnesty International only sees or wants to see one side? Why they do not see another side? That's Let me a question. just press you on this. Are you categorically saying that cluster munitions have not been used by Azerbaijani forces? Uh, and, and, and if so, are you prepared to allow independent observers to verify that? Yes, we are prepared to do it. Also, we are prepared to see how Armenia will allow independent observers to see what they have been doing. And so it should be not unilateral, it should be bilateral. We defend ourselves and we uh, must do it, but uh, our targets are only military objectives. 
and almost all of what we have destroyed, we destroyed from the very modern equipment. You can find it on internet. It's Turkish, brand new, excellent, marvelous uh, fighter drones. It is uh, other equipment which destroy, uh, you know, tanks, guns, uh, military, you know, positions. So we don't need to use these kind of weapons in order to uh, achieve our goal. Our target are not civilians. Our target are occupants. We must uh, return our land to those whom it belongs to. So Armenia can and will speak for themselves. I'm asking you specifically, uh, you categorically deny, do you, that cluster munitions have been used by Azerbaijani forces? Yes, I, I deny it and I want to ask you, did you ask this question to Armenian president? We didn't have the uh, information at the time. Ah, yeah, well, that's the point, that's the point. You ask me, ask him, ask him. Let Amnesty International ask him what they do. We will certainly ask them for a statement. I'm yeah. asking you. Ask him. I, I, I answered already, I already answered. No, and ask him. I will. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Have the full range of human rights which people here in Azerbaijan do not have. Will they have a fully free media? Will they have an opposition that's allowed to raise its voice? Will they be allowed to have things that people here in Azerbaijan do not have? Uh, you think they do not have it? Why do you think that people in Azerbaijan do not have free media and opposition? Because this is what I'm told by independent sources in this country. Which independent sources? Many independent sources. <laughs> Tell me which. I certainly couldn't name sources. Oh, if you couldn't name, that means yeah. that you're just inventing the story. So you're saying the media is not under state control? Not at all. And there is a vibrant free opposition media? Where of course. Where, where do I see this? You can see it in the internet. You can see it everywhere. But not in newspapers. Why? You can see it in newspapers. Whom do you call opposition here? Can I ask you? Well, is there allowed to be an opposition here? Yeah, it is allowed, of course. I mean, NGOs are the subject of a crackdown. Journalists no. are the subject of a crackdown. Not at all. Critics are in jail. No, not at all. None of this is true. Absolutely fake. Absolutely. We have free media. We have free internet. Now, due to the martial law, we have some restrictions. But before, there have been no restrictions. And the number of uh, internet users in Azerbaijan is uh, more than 80%. Can you imagine the restriction of media in a country where internet is free, there is no censorship, and there are 80% of internet users? We have millions of people on Facebook. How can you say that we don't have free media? This is, a, again, a biased approach. This is an attempt to create a perception in Western audience about Azerbaijan. We have opposition, we have NGOs, we have uh, free political activity, we have free media, we have uh, freedom of speech. But if you raise this question, can I ask you also one? How do you uh, assess what happened to Mr. Assange? Is it a reflection of free media in your country? We're not here to discuss no, my let's country. Discuss. No, let's discuss. No, President In order Ali to accuse me, saying that Armenians will not have free uh, media here, let's talk about Assange. How many years, sorry, how many years he spent in Ecuadorian embassy? And for what? And where is he now? For journalistic activity. You kept that person hostage, actually killing him morally and physically. You did it, not us, and now he's in prison. So you have no moral right to talk about free media when you do these things. Returning to the conflict, how Yeah, better long... return to the conflict because this is not what you like. You like only to accuse, only to attack. But look at the mirror. Look, I tell many times, before coming and lecturing us, and in your question, accusing me, it's not a question, it's accusation. You talk like a prosecutor. Why? If you're so democratic, and so objective. Why you keep Assange in prison? For what? You keep him in prison because of his journalistic activity. I'm not keeping him in prison, President Aliyev. <laughs> but you don't like this. It's, it's not course. a question of don't like. You are it's not, not used it's, to this. It's not the subject of our interview. Because you are used only to attack. It's not the subject only. of our interview. And with respect, no, President Aliyev. It is Aliyev, not the subject of interview, but you raise it. You, you raised, raised it. No, you raised it. You raised the case you of Assange. You said Armenians, if you, you don't have a free media in your country, how Armenians can live without opposition. That was your yeah. accusation. 